Uh, ladies and gentlemen, I guess even the mic is uh, telling me to calm down a bit. I guess we all need that a little bit, right? I mean, it's it's hot, it's Jaipur. I can see the fans are out. Maybe we can use our, you know, the badges as props just to fan ourselves and become our own fans for a moment. But what I'll do just to get the energy up for all of us, it's become a front lawn ritual as you must have seen already. I will come to the center of the stage and give you guys a big namaskar. And I'm glad that the fan trend is catching on. But for that moment, just leave your fans and wish the namaskar back to me so that I get the energy from you guys as well. I'll come here and we'll do a namaskar ritual, okay? Right, ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the 15th edition of the JFO Literature Festival, protected by Detol Banega Swast India. We are at the front lawn and our next session is a book launch, first edition in an ideal world, Kunal Basu in conversation with Manasi Subramaniam. Altaf Hussain, a young Muslim student, has been abducted from his college hostel. Rumors claim he has gone to fight the jihad in Iraq. The divide between liberals and nationalists invades the Sen Gupta household in Kolkata when Joy, a bank manager, and Rohini, his school teacher wife, learn the shocking news that their only son, Bobby, has become a leader of the nationalist students and is implicated in Altaf's disappearance. Out to solve the mystery of Altaf, Joy and Rohini discover conspiracy and hate. Forbidden love and exceptional courage in Kunal Basu's In an Ideal World. Will they succeed in absolving their son of the heinous crime? Will Altaf be found after all? Or will they and this fractured nation pay the ultimate price for harboring a fractured heart? May I now invite on stage the author, Mr. Kunal Basu. Kunal Basu is the author of several critically acclaimed novels, including The Miniaturist and Calcutta, if I'm not wrong, and a collection of short stories titled The Japanese Wife, the lead story of which has been made into an award-winning film. His work has been widely translated and nominated for prestigious awards. We welcome you, Mr. Kunal. May we also now have on stage Ms. Manasi Subramaniam, who's the associate publisher and head of rights at Penguin Random House India. We welcome you, Ms. Manasi. May I now request the both of them to unveil the cover of the book in an ideal world. I will now depart the stage and leave you to an ideal world itself. Thank you so much, ladies and gentlemen. What an ideal day on which to launch an, in, a, in an ideal world. Congratulations. Thank you. Thank you. So before we begin, I thought it might be nice if we gave everyone a little sampler of the book. So would you like to do a short reading from the book? Absolutely. Um, you know, as I was walking up the stage, somebody ex asked me, so what kind of session are you expecting? And I said, I'm expecting a hot session. Not only is this a hot day in Jaipur, but the theme of my novel, as you've just heard, is probably going to lead to a few sparks. But so be it. Um, let me tell you a little bit about the setup of the piece that I'm going to read. So Joy Sengupta is a bank manager in Kolkata. It could be HDFC, ICICI, SBI, so many different banks. His wife, Rohini, is a school teacher. She's a head of a private school. Now, both of them were activists in their university years. They played the guitar and sang Joan Baez and John Lennon. They acted in theater. They participated in protests and demonstrations. But now in their 40s, they're comfortable. They lead a very uh, liberal life, full of art, 
full of friends. Maybe they even come to JLF occasionally. Okay. And their only son, Bobby, is a student of computer science in a city called Manhar in a neighboring state. Could be Jharkhand, could be Bihar, and so on and so forth. So one day, Joyce and Gupta, when he's out on a cigarette break at work, gets a phone call. The call is from his ex-comrade, Mimi, who was an activist in university. And Joy is surprised. And uh, he says, well, we should meet. Uh, it's been a long time. And Mimi said, yes, we should meet this afternoon. He said, today? I'm a bit caught up with work. He says, no, no, no. Make some excuses. We need to meet this evening. And so Joy and Mimi, after 20 years, meet for the first time in this quaint restaurant in Kolkata called Fleury's. And it begins with Joy pulling Mimi's leg. Mimi tells him that she's a student administrator in the university where Bobby, Joy and Rohini's son, is a student. So Joy says, so you have quit being an activist and become a despot, whipping students into shape. What activism are you talking about? Mimi retorted, do you have any idea what's happening in college campuses all over India? It's nothing short of war. You mean like the wars we used to fight? Boycotting exams, calling strikes, barricading, picketing, shouting slogans, dropping her knife onto her plate. Mimi gave Joy a long stare. You really don't know, do you? Our thing was child's play, a storm in a teacup. All that's finished. Now you have the real deal. You've heard of the nationalist students, haven't you? Joy nodded with an eye on the little girl at the next table who was badgering her mother for ice cream. Those that want to cleanse the nation of impurities. He recited lines read in the papers, making the sign of double quotes in the air. Exactly. They want to create a Hindu homeland in India. They're talking about a golden age. Muslims are outsiders. Christians too. Only they are the true inheritors of the soil. It's divine children. But that's just saying, Joy stifled a yawn, like we used to demand a dictatorship of the proletariat. It's more than words. The students are hell bent on stopping meat from entering the campus. They want a curfew at the women's hostel. They're harassing liberal minded professors, targeting Muslims, storming plays, banning couples from dating on Valentine's Day, demanding the university rewrite the textbooks. The nationalists are creating havoc. You know about Altaf, don't you? Mimi gazed unblinkingly at him. Who? The poor Muslim boy who was abducted from his hostel room in our university. He and his friends opposed the nationalists. Maybe there were some arguments between the two sides. He was kidnapped and taken away. No one knows where he is. Joy nodded. He had watched it on the news. The mention of Manhar and Bobby's university had caught his eye. It has been three months now. There's no trace of him. Altaf's mother, Ruksana, has come from her village to look for her son. The poor woman has been going around pleading to everyone. The university administration, the police, the government. But no one's come forward to help her. Do you think he might still be alive? Joy tapped the empty espresso cup on the table drawing Gomez's attention. Can I have one more of those two? Mimi spoke under her breath. Her face seemed more strained than when she'd arrived at Fleury's. Fidgeting with her spoon, she resumed. That's the question no one has an answer to. Is he being held captive in a secret hideout? Are they torturing him? Have they finished him off already? But someone must know, right? He can't simply disappear into thin air. Taking a sip of her espresso, Mimi leant forward on her chair. You can help Altaf. Let his mother know what happened to him. Me? Paul's exclamation drew attention to their table. A senior journalist holding court among his juniors gave him an inquisitive look. Busy with other patrons, 
Gomez stuck out his hands to indicate he'd be free soon to attend to Mr. Sengupta and his guests. This is why I've come all the way from Manhur to plead with you, to meet you face to face, rather than speak on the phone. You can help Altaf and his mother. I wish to meet you urgently before it's too late to save him. Setting down his cup, Joy collected himself before speaking. How can I help, Mimi? I'm a banker. We don't know about these things. We deal with money, with savings and loans, not kidnapping. If the police won't help, how can I? You know someone who knows. You can persuade him to reveal the truth. Mimi's voice took on a greater urgency. Your son, Bobby, can tell us everything that has happened to Altaf. Thank you. Thank you. And I'm, I'm really glad you picked this section because it actually takes us down a couple of the parts that I would love for us to talk about. So one is, Flurries is a quintessentially Calcutta setting. But the other thing that I think is interesting is that a large part of your setting is actually fictitious. Why did you choose to create a fictitious setting and an imaginary setting for a large section of the novel? And is it based on something, a specific campus that you have in mind? Um, I did not want to give Bobby's campus, I didn't want to set Bobby's campus in a place that we know. It could have been Ranchi, it could have been Jamshedpur, it could have been any city, it could have been Raipur. The flashy new university campuses, private universities that are coming up, okay? And parents are spending a lot of money in getting their children admitted. But I didn't want to give it a, the name of a real place because the contextuality of the place would then detract from the central thrust of the novel. I also wanted to leave Manhar as a sort of a, a mysterious place, a place that the Kolkata couple isn't familiar with. Their son has gone to study there, but they know nothing about Manhar. Who lived there? What are the dynamics there? Uh, and therefore, the search for the killer of Altaf or the reasons behind the disappearance of Altaf the search to determine if Bobby was implicated also becomes a search for Manhar, also becomes a search for an India that this very sophisticated, liberal-minded couple in their Kolkata cocoon are not familiar with. But it is also a campus. And what many of our audience members may not be aware of is that you also live on a campus. You teach at Oxford. You encounter students every day. We know that in India, our campuses are changing. There's a lot going on on our campuses, which um, for many of us who grew up in a different generation, we were, we were politicized, politicized in one way, but I think campuses are now being politicized in a completely different way. Tell me about, a little bit about the changes that you're seeing on campus every day in your life and how that's reflected in your novel. You know, Oxford is um, miraculously free of student activities. Uh, the student activities that you see in Oxford is cricket, okay? But Indian campuses have always been hotbeds for political expression, for cultural expression. I grew up in the 70s in Kolkata, where uh, the then chief minister of Bengal said, it is safer to walk through the jungles of Sundarban at night than to walk through the campuses of Kolkata during daytime, okay? So obviously students, you know, have express themselves in terms of the ideals of society that they aspire for. What's changed? What's changed is today the nature of education, given the nature that many of these, these private universities, when students are closeted away and provided with packaged education, completely deprived of con contact with social reality, they grew up with a blank canvas. They grew up with an empty canvas. And this empty campus, uh, canvas is one where wily recruiters are able to leave their mark, which is what Joy finds when he goes to Manhar. He finds Bobby's recruiter, who's an incredibly smart man. And the way he talks to Bobby and the way Bobby is entranced by his views about life, views about what India should be, is a revelation to Joy. There are no checks and balances because the university is far removed from the city. They couldn't come to festivals like this. They wouldn't be attending plays. They wouldn't be attending political programs by all kinds of parties, okay? So here in their very artificial environment, which is happening in many campuses in India, not all of them, they become 
the easy targets or recruits of extreme forces. So the ideals of society, which is a phrase you just used, is that where the title comes from in an ideal world? It does. When I was writing this novel, and this novel was written in anguish. This novel was written in anguish because the last couple of years has, has be, have been troubling for lots of us as a result of the pandemic. But the last couple of years have also been troubling given the outpouring of incredible hate in this country. The kind of hate that I have not seen growing up, born and, being, and growing up in this country. You know, Shaheen Bagh, C-A-N-R-C, uh, the recent hijab controversy, the battle between the 80% and the 20% have taken us into a domain of hatred, a kind of distrust, which in many ways uh, acted as uh, so the, the driver, the motivation for this novel. Why in an ideal world? Today, an Indian nation, which is on its, the verge of its 75th birthday, a very young nation, France as a nation is 350 years old. Indian civilization is thousands of years old, but as a nation, we are about just turning 75. We are a young nation. So the battle is being fought in India between two competing ideals of what this country wants to be when it grows up. Should it continue in its path of being a liberal, secular, inclusive democracy, or should it be a Hindu Rashtra? Okay. And this division, between the two ideals is not simply a political division. We have heard in this version of the GLF speakers from different political parties in varieties of sessions. And we often tend to confuse ourselves by saying, oh, this is a clash between BJP and INC. This is not a partisanal clash that we are observing. It's a civilizational conflict that we're seeing. It is a wound in the heart of the soul of our citizens that we are witnessing and which led me to this sort of title of in an ideal world, whose ideal world and what ideal. But Kunal, I also get, get the feeling that you're responding exactly like Bobby's parents responded. You're saying that this is not the India I grew up in. This is a completely different idea, idea of India. It's a brand new world. That's precisely how Bobby's resp parents respond, saying we didn't grow up in this world. What is happening in the world around us? And I can't help wondering, is this this gigantic bubble that the liberals, we the liberals have created around us where we haven't noticed how this country is changing and we're, we're in, it's almost as if we're in an echo chamber. We're only hearing each other and all of a sudden we're astonished that, oh, there are big changes happening in the world. How come I didn't notice this? I couldn't agree with you more. I couldn't agree with you more. I have this feeling that this novel, which is uh, sometimes is getting hugely trolled for obvious reasons, uh, is not going to please either side completely. Because uh, I do uh, describe situations, environments, where there's a huge amount of smugness among the liberal, secular, uh, uh, you know, uh, friends of joy and Rohini. And in some sense, they believe that the liberal project is complete. You know, we can attend GLF and we can express our views. Uh, we can say whatever we want to say. We can engage in debate. So India must be a liberal country, isn't it? And this is, in many ways, the myth that we have created for ourselves. And as you correctly pointed out, there is another India or many other Indians, Indias outside of the confines of Clark Amir. Okay. What do they think about us? Do they see the liberal agenda as being something which is liberating and beneficial in their lives or something which is made up? Okay. And therefore, uh, you're absolutely right. In this novel, too, I leave the implication, I leave the readers with the, with the thought that, you know, maybe there needs to be an understanding between both, an understanding that has gone missing. So what is the liberal order that you just spoke of? Uh, do you mean the challenge that we face? No. So what, what is the liberal ideal of this world? You know, the liberal idea is what we grew up in, what the founding fathers of the Indian constitution wrote in the Indian constitution in 1947 that India, unlike its neighbors, unlike its neighbors is going to be an inclusive, secular, pluralistic nation when everybody, regardless of caste, creed, religion, uh, gender, and uh, any other orientation will have equal stake, okay? Um, you know, this is, was, and I, I believe that this was perhaps the most radical stance taken by a new nation. Think of what's happened to nations who have ethnic diversity, okay? 
Europe has fought two major wars and is in the brink or already engulfed in a third war. The Soviet Union, a, a collection of republics, has collapsed. China has browbeaten its ethnic minorities, the Uyghurs, the Mongolians, the Tibetans, into submission to the Han ways. Okay? All the American nations have pretty much exterminated the indigenous populations, whereas India, at this hour of birth, had taken this amazingly radical and amazingly romantic vision of what a nation should look like. And that is the liberal vision that you know, we all have equal stake in this society. So let's buy into this project for a second, that this is how this country was created with these ideals. Um, how did this project fail with so many people at the helm of it? Yeah, which is, which is one of the things that I try to explore. This is not a work of nonfiction. This is a work of fiction. And therefore, through incidents, through characters and their conversations, I try to uncover that very thing. See, when Joy and Rohini are shocked by Bobby, the, 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 the essential question they ask as parents do is, how did this happen? What went wrong? What was I not paying attention to as parents? Okay, and they begin their investigations. And the investigations, investigations reveal a number of things to your question. The, investigation, the investigations reveal, for example, that religiosity is an important feature for many Indians. So being secular does not mean getting rid of religiosity. Religiosity is perhaps something to be celebrated. Okay if that religiosity does not hurt individuals and people of other religions. Okay? They encounter a couple in Manhar who are perfectly decent people. They're not liberal in their views, and they, but they're perfectly decent uh, uh, people. I describe a Ram Navami march in Manhar. Okay? And the excitement, the enthusiasm, the passion for that. What does Joy see there? So that's certainly one aspect, okay? Ignoring the other realities. The, the other aspect certainly has to be that the liberal project of a nation is ultimately doomed to failure unless the majority of the citizens of our country are brought out of poverty, are brought out of unemployment, okay? Are given an economic stake in this society before they can stake uh, lay their stakes to cultural and other identities, okay? And the liberal project in 75 years has by and large stuttered, slipped and slided in that area. I often look around in these festivals and I see who are the people who are serving us food? Who are the people who are driving us from one destination to another? What about this, player, this musician who's sitting in the shade there and is trying to entertain me and author as I go past him paying him scant attention. Okay. That is the India that we have ignored. What do they think of us? What do they think of this festival? Okay. If this is all for the upliftment of Indian society, have we really succeeded in drawing them into the liberal, in, into the ways of thinking? And therefore, multiple reasons, multiple causalities for the failure in the liberal vision. I think you're implying in some sense that a lot of the conversations that we have really don't matter in, in the big picture of India. Uh, because, because, as you said, we are having a conversation about the idea of a liberal India, about what a divisive society and culture we live in, the polarizing opinions around us. But perhaps this conversation doesn't really matter because the, is it actually going to affect change? And I want to actually change the context. Let's not talk about this conversation but let's actually talk about the role of fiction. Do you think that, the, that political fiction, which I am aware is a departure for you as a novelist as well, uh, can bring about change in any way? And what is the reason you went in this direction? Uh, look, arguments have run their course. Uh, this is a fascinating question, Mans Mansi, I have to say, because this is what keeps me awake at night as an Indian. Okay, is we know that there's a rift. We know that there's a divide. And if I may digress for a moment, uh, a bunch of my friends, senior doctors in Kolkata, told me that we, recently we went on a holiday. And before we went on a holiday together, we decided not to discuss politics during our holiday. A bunch of Bengalis deciding not to discuss politics. Okay. Uh, a friend at this festival told me 
that there is a border across our dining table at home. Okay? We have become strangers to each other. So my question is, how do we bridge this rift? The politicians are going to pit us anyway for their narrow aims of winning at the ballot box. But how do we, the center of India, the citizens of India, bridge this? You know, Spinoza once wrote, reason cannot defeat emotion. Reason cannot defeat emotion. And perhaps we have been appealing at the wrong target. You know, I've been to umpteen sessions in JLF on democracy and tolerance and etc. I don't for a moment think that as successful as these sessions might be, if there's a person from the other side attending these sessions, that they would be convinced of the logic and change their minds. That they would come out and say, I've learned something new in JLF today. I will change my view of the ideal of India. Idea arguments have run their course. Very smart people have written newspaper columns, have written books trying to convince the other side, whatever be the other side. The other side is held steadfast in its views. So how are we going to bridge this? We're going to bridge this through a slow and deep process, the process of the arts, which bypasses the cognitive mechanism and appeals directly to you. So I'm going to give you some examples now. You know, in South Africa, the apartheid regime ended in 1990. Okay? In 1987, Cry Freedom, the film Cry Freedom was released. And we then lived in America. And when we went to see the opening of the film, black and white audiences stood up at the end of the film. Okay? There were tears in the eyes of black and white audiences when Peter Gabriel sang, Biko, Biko, Biko. I've seen Israeli and Palestinian ex-combatants, ex-combatants, form the Gaza Theater Group and the Gaza Theater Group enacting their tales from both sides. Okay? I've seen dancers in Argentina at the height of the economic crisis using the tango as a means of bringing people from different parts of the world together, different parts of the society together. It is the hour for the arts. It is not the hour necessarily for arguments, it is the hour for the arts. It is the hour to appeal directly, and their fiction plays a role, and it's not simply fiction. Cinema does, theater does, music does, dance does. Okay? And that is the mission of healing India that I envision. I'm so glad you think that it is the hour for the arts. I think so too. Uh, I also kind of hope that we're going to have our own version of the Roaring Twenties, where we will kind of come back into society with a lot of love for the arts in so many different ways. How do you think, um, wh what do you think is the role that empathy might play in, um, you, you said just now that maybe we can't change people's minds, but I think we can, inject empathy into conversations through the arts. Um, and I think that that's possibly one of the primary things that we need to do in order to be able to have nuanced conversations about the world that's around us. What do you think is the role that empathy plays in fiction? Because you've picked fiction to write, you've picked the vehicle of fiction to write about a very, very real world, a world that we're all living in. Um, I don't want to give the ending away. Because it, it plays out like detective fiction almost. What will Joy and Rohini find? Will they find Altaf an alive Altaf? Will they find that Bobby was responsible or wasn't responsible? And they will find out at the end. Okay, so I'm not going to reveal that. Empathy is crucial. Empathy is key. You know, Ustad Ali Akbar Khan uh, created a raga called Karuna Supreme. Okay. And karuna has two meanings, one a lower meaning and one a higher meaning. The lower meaning is pity, the higher meaning is compassion. Okay? Karuna supreme. And there is no way that in the present quagmire that we find ourselves in India and in the world generally, the war raging in Europe, troubles in every part of the world, the only way, there is no magic wand of policy. There is no magic wand of a political ideal that is going to solve this issue. But the human heart of with empathy, overcoming them, okay? And uh, look, this is not an easy process. This is not a quick fix. This is not something for which we'll see the end result very quickly. But this is the place to begin. 
fostering empathy to the arts. Before we go into audience questions, I want the final question I want to ask you is, how do we do this on campuses right now? Uh, what do you think we as individuals can do to re-liberalize uh, the campuses of our country? Uh, look, I always say this, you know, 1.3 billion Indians, right? Roughly 1.3 billion Indians. Take the kids out. We're a 1 billion adult population or thereabouts, okay? Even if you take recent poll numbers, and polls are not a good indication of what's inside our hearts, okay? You can't take half a billion Indians who don't agree with you and drop them into the Arabian Sea. You can't see other half of half a billion Indians and drop them into the Bay of Bengal. You couldn't do that. You couldn't imprison, you couldn't use laws in order to suppress half a billion Indians. It has been tried before in this world and it has failed. Oppression has been tried in much larger scale in this world. It has always failed. So what, what's the message in, at the campus? I used to be a college activist, a university activist many, many years ago when my hair was still black. And the, the notion is what we used to do in college campuses during, 1980, during the emergency years. There is a resonance of the emergency years in this novel. Because in my college days growing up, we did feel the brunt of oppression. It was perpetrated by a different political formation, a different political party to the one that we have now. What were our answers? We stage plays on campus. We encouraged debates. We had poetry recitations. We had film festivals. And that three years of, emerg of the emergency actually created a whole momentum within the campuses of Bengal which was against oppression, which was against uh, taking away shackles and restrictions. So what I would say is not to counter violence with violence in the campuses, because that's not going to work. The media is going to create a narrative which is going to be uncomfortable to everybody. Okay. So not counter violence with violence, but counter violence with the arts. If I were at JNU, if I were in Jamia, if I were in any of these campuses as a young activist now, I would do street plays. I would stand outside the, the, uh, the, uh, the, camp, uh, the cafeteria and I would have people sing songs okay? and be as inclusive as possible, as inclusive as possible in terms of the cultural expressions. May not work, but nothing else will anyway. You heard it here first, folks. Counter, counter violence with the arts. Let's try that. On that note, uh, let's go to some audience questions. I see a gentleman in the third row over here. Hello, sir. I enjoyed your conversation, every single bit of it. Uh, do you think that the liberalism which you are referring to is on the wane in India? Because uh, for a very long time in India, only one particular community was expected to be liberal. While we liberals, we actually uh, didn't expect the other community, which was all the time asserting its uh, uh, identity, religion and everything, the way they used to vote. Uh, that was const uh, com uh, all the time neglected. And secondly, all these secular parties also, because of their uh, vote bank politics and appeasement and everything, actually uh, uh, angered the other side. And uh, that led to the kind of politics, the uh, uh, politics of uh, uh, religion and everything which is now happening in India. Because of that, only this liberalism, as you are referring to, is on the wane. So I just wanted to ask you that. Look, fair question. I may not agree with your prognosis or diagnosis of why it had happened, but it's a fair question. Okay. Look, um, if you take the electoral arithmetic out of the question, I grew up in Bengal, what you refer to as the other side. Let's bring the elephant into the room. That's what we should do in a literary festival. Let's not you know, talk euphemisms. The Muslim community in, in, in Bengal did not play a part in vote bank politics. They were not purely involved in identity politics. There was cultural amity, cultural cohesion, cultural collaboration between these communities be over and beyond the political parties. When people say that the, the reason that West Bengal has not seen riots is because of the communist rule, they're wrong. The reason West Bengal has not, hasn't seen riots is because of Rabindranath Thakur, because of Nojudul Islam, because of Raja Ramohan Rai. Because of Shorachanda Chattopadhyay. Okay. 
So the cultural dynamics of a place determine the kind of cohesion that builds, that, that is built. To your question, is liberalism on the decline? It's in decline everywhere in the world. And it's not surprising because remember, political thought waxes and wanes. What is in decline today can actually re-emerge many times powerful in the future. And that's what you and I would want, isn't it? Uh, let's take a question from the lady in the front row, please. It was wonderful to hear you today. Uh, now, the last point that you mentioned that you would like to counter our, uh, violence with art, uh, I think we should remember Sabdar Hashmi. Uh, I, given the scenario, the present scenario, I don't think that would be allowed, maybe. Uh, second question uh, that I have is, uh, going down, uh, say, 50 years later, or maybe 100 years later, when people go to your book, uh, will they be able to, you know, get a very clear picture of the real times, which are, uh, I mean, as of now, like, for example, if we uh, look at Premchand, you know, and we can kind of, uh, you know, build up a kind of social fabric that existed during his times. So this is a work of fiction, no doubt. But uh, do you think that it would give a very clear and a real picture of the times of today? So to your first Thank question, you. yeah, to your first question, I do know, remember Sadhguru Hashmi. I used to know him. Okay, um, I don't believe that we should take impossibility as the impediment. Okay, all social movements have been born in domains of impossibility, but they've made the impossible possible through their movements. Okay, will there be costs to pay? Of course. Okay, to your second question. I will not be able to give you an answer to that question. It's up to you, the reader. When you read the novel, you could say, you know, it actually does not paint the picture of real India. It's a piece of fiction. And you can go away with that perspective. Or you could say, and it will please my heart if you say that, that yes, it provides an accurate depiction of our reality, not simply in terms of the news, but in terms of our psychological reality as citizens of India in 2022. Let's take something from the back. I see, I see a couple of hands in the back. Can we go somewhere there? Very, very nice uh, talk, sir. My uh, point is the media glamorizes divisive politics. All along, the whole election game, every channel loves to portray divisive politics. If we don't promote it, it will not become mainstream. Every day, play one hour of Sadhguru or Art of Living or somebody who's promoting, uh, you know, cohesiveness rather than divisiveness. Um, you know, uh, you've touched on a very um, live wire issue. In my life growing up in this country, even to the emergency, I've never seen the media play as shameless a role as they play today. And by shameless, I don't mean that you know, people uh, uh, that uh, that speakers speaking contrary to my personal views. In my other life, I'm a professor. I'm very used to taking criticism. You can criticize me, but if you do that with a smiling face, I will respond to you with a smiling face. Okay. But what we see in the name of critique is abuse, and it's worse in social media. Okay. This book was published uh, a month ago, roughly a month ago. Okay. So the social media trolls that I'm receiving are, I mean, fortunately, there are some good things as well, are atrocious. The people are saying, go to Pakistan. Okay. Now, this has nothing to do with Pakistan. This has nothing to do with taking sides in any political sense. Why would I want to go to Pakistan to live there? I would love to visit Pakistan to see Mohan Jadaro and Harappa. Okay. Uh, you know, there are all kinds of things people are insinuating. So this, the abuse has come to dominate the space that we exist in. And it's up to us to turn it off. Any other, okay, I, I see a hand up here. Yeah. Good afternoon panel. I want to ask that, uh, what are your views on the mentality of right-wing people who are hardcore to their religion? 
my approach towards anybody who is at the extreme. I'm a believer in the center of our, you know, in Indian polity. I believe in the center. The center gets abused all the time. People say the center is namby pamby, is weak. But remember, the center is the only alternative. The extremes are not. Look, I have lived through the Naxal movement in the 1970s. Okay, extreme ideology. Okay, an extreme ideal. Okay, which says anybody who is in favor of my ideal is a good person. Anybody who's not needs to be eliminated. Okay. And I know the extremes don't work. The extremes are not viable. The only thing that is viable is the center. So what is my attitude? Engagement, dialogue, conversation, not demonization. If you are a member of the RSS, come and talk to me. Share a cup of tea with me. You will see that I'm not a demon. Okay. And that is what we citizens of India need to do. We need to take the mantle away from the media and from the politicians and say that this country belongs to us. Not for your narrow aims. Sir, then how can we change their mindset? Again, your mindset might also change in conversation. Okay. So conversation and dialogue is the only way forward. And that will take time. That will take some effort. And most of all, it will require a broad mindset, a, a, a nature, a quality of tolerance. Okay. Thank you, sir. I see a hand in the back over there. Hi. Um, yeah, really interesting talk. Thanks a lot. Um, I was wondering if we link the arts with social change and try to make it inclusive. What's the contribution of the minorities? How are they silenced? And how can we counter that silence in the field of the arts? Thank you. Uh, look, there are no easy answers. But the one great benefit of the arts is that its starting point is not exclusionary. So for example, you want to stage a street play in Delhi, okay? And you're a theater director or you've written this play, okay? Nothing prevents you from assembling a cast and assembling a troupe, which is drawn from diverse communities and diverse perspectives, okay? It does not start with the notion that unless you're a party member, you cannot be a, an actor in this play. Okay? So the very act of the arts is an inclusive arts, an inclusive act, or it can become an inclusive act. But it requires the will of the artist. The will of the artist is supreme. And if that happens, then the arts will truly be inclusive. There's still one more hand at the back. Okay, so in this era of darkness, we live in two Indias, one that believes in peace, whereas other that believes that in order to love orange, they have to hate green. So in between these two Indias, how do you think that this gap can be bridged? The green, the saffron and the white is our national flag. It includes everybody. It includes everybody. And it can only be bridged through, again, as I said, and I cannot overemphasize this, in your locality, in your tea shop, at your home, at your campus, at your workplace, wherever you see political discussions going on, don't avoid, engage. And when you engage, engage in the spirit that engagement can only lead to mutual understanding. And in that process, your own understanding may change a bit. Mine may change a bit. Okay, but give that a chance, give dialogue a chance. Do we have any? Oh, there's a lady right in the front over here. Thank you. Well, first of all, Kunal, I have I am so moved and so inspired by this session. I'm gonna straight after the session go get a copy of my book. That was it, it's been a wonderful session. Uh, my question to you is a little different. Uh, you spoke about there being no political activism in Oxford, and we know what a hallowed space Oxford is. And at the same time, we have political activism uh, in all our major universities. 
And I'm referring to a conversation that happened yesterday in another session where somebody was advocating saying that if we can take political activism away from our universities, our universities would be better. What would be your response to that? If you discourage students from engaging with life, then their engaging engagement with academics will be sterile. You know, uh, and it's not simply me saying this. Years and years, decades of research in education, and I've got many colleagues who are research education show that the best students emerge with a holistic view of life. The narrow student who excels in one particular aspect goes up to a certain point in their chosen profession and then, then they stop. So even from the perspective of holistic education, you would want to foment, and I'm using the word foment cautiously, but deliberately, you want to foment students to think outside the box, to go and question. Okay, you know this. I'll, I'll give you a very simple example. So, I teach at the business school, something very prosaic. I'm a professor of business. Okay, and in the history of Oxford, no business school has ever, ever had a course on the arts. Never. Okay, can you imagine business without art, visual art, performing art, literary art, nothing. So when I started this, my dean and the senior professors sort of they frowned and said, what is this? Has Kunal got crazy? And the students, they engaged in a in spontaneous, I wouldn't call it uprising, but spontaneous movement saying, we actually want to read Tolstoy. We actually want to read Sadat Hassan Manto. There are many Indian students there. We want to read this. We want to see, read plays by Berthold Brecht. And it became a standard feature of the business school. Okay? So in small measure, may not be in large measure, I misspoke because there's one movement that happened last year in Oxford, which was a Black Lives Matter movement, which was a movement to bring down the statue of Cecil Rhodes from Jesus College. Jesus College was, was resistant, they didn't want. And students of all colors got together and engaged in that movement. You know what the real value of that is? The real value is not to bring down the statue of Cecil Rhodes, but the students who participated in this movement went away with a broader view and vision of this world that they will inhabit. I think we're clean out of time. Thank you, folks, for a very, very enjoyable, if incredibly hot afternoon. Let's hope we live in an ideal world very soon. Thank you, Kunal. Thank you for writing this book and thank you for being in conversation thank with you, me. Manasi. Thank you, audience. Well, we might know that an ideal world might take some time to achieve. This was, however, an ideal session. Started on time and on time and in between, there were so many questions and answers like a good, vibrant democracy. Ladies and gentlemen, uh, Kunal Basu in conversation with Manasi Subramaniam in an ideal world. May we also request the speakers to accept a small token of our love and appreciation. And you will find them there. Yellow tent, book signing. You know the drill. You know the geography. You can turn back and have a look. It will be there, just there. Cute yellow little tent. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you for being so patient with us. We know the heat in Jaipur 